Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about Kindler syndrome. It's a very, very interesting topic. So let's get started. If you're visiting my channel for the first time, my name is Dr. Namra Aziz, resident dermatology. I make a lot of educational content. If you haven't subscribed my channel, please click the subscribe button and the bell icon to get notifications. You can also follow me on Instagram at Dr. Namra Aziz. First of all, what is Kindler syndrome? Since Kindler syndrome is classified as a subtype of epidermolysis bullosa, so it will have trauma-induced blistering. But in addition to that, you can see some additional features. Photosensitivity, progressive poikiloderma, cutaneous atrophy, mucosal inflammation, and squamous cell carcinoma of skin and mucosal surfaces. Kindler syndrome is one of the genodermatoses and is inherited in autosomal recessive pattern. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of Kindler syndrome. Theresa Kindler described a patient with acral blistering and photosensitivity during infancy, followed late in life by progressive poikiloderma and atrophy. 20 years later, Weary reported 10 members of a single family with similar findings. Why would someone get Kindler syndrome? Like I said before, it's a genodermatosis, so some genes must be affected. Kindler syndrome occurs because of the mutation in a gene called as FIRMT1 gene, which is also called as kin one gene. This gene encodes a protein, fermitin family homolog 1 protein, which is also called as Kindler 1 protein. This Kindler protein is a component of a focal adhesion proteins. This leads to a very, very important question, what are focal adhesion proteins? It's important to understand here that these are different structures from hemidesmosome. This requires a little bit of explanation here. Let's start from the basics. These are basal keratinocytes. This is basement membrane zone. And this is papillary dermis. This is the hemidesmosomes which connect the keratin filaments to the basement membrane. Focal adhesion proteins, like I said before, are the separate structures where actin filaments are connected to the basement membrane. Actin filaments are connected to the protein Kindlin 1, which is further connected to alpha 3 beta 1 integrin. It is the Kindler 1 protein which is defective in the Kindler syndrome. This is another image which is showing the attachment of the actin filaments um, via the Kindlin 1 to the basement membrane zone. Due to mutation in this gene, there is disruption of the attachment of the actin filaments at the dermoepidermal junction. It's important to emphasize here that Kindler syndrome is the first genodermatosis caused by a defect in actin extracellular membrane linkage rather than keratin extracellular membrane link linkage which underlies the pathology of other inherited skin fragility syndrome, for example other subtypes of epidermolysis bullosa. We also say there is reduplication of the basement membrane in Kindler syndrome. Why this reduplication occurs? Kindler 1 deficient cells respond to the cell stress by upregulating the pro inflammatory and pro fibrotic cytokines. These cytokines initiate an inflammatory response in the dermis, resulting in the activation of the fibroblast, which differentiate into myofibroblast. Myofibroblast secrete and deposit increased amount of extracellular matrix protein. Repeated cycles of epidermal cell stress, cytokine secretion, dermal inflammation and profibrotic process underlies the pathogenesis of the reduplication of basement membrane in Kindler syndrome as well as mucocutaneous fibrosis. Next question would be why people with Kindler syndrome have cutaneous atrophy and increased risk of malignancy. Kindlin 1 also has a role in cutaneous epithelial stem cell homeostasis, with loss of Kindlin 1 protein leading to the increased risk of skin cancers as well as cutaneous atrophy due to stem cell exhaustion and premature death of the keratinocytes. Then why patients with Kindlin 1 deficiency have photosensitivity? Well, that's a tricky topic. Well, that's a tricky topic. There have been some theories about it. There is some level of impairment of DNA repair because of the FIRMT1 mutation. In addition to that, pro-inflammatory cytokines are also increased in the Kindler syndrome skin following the UVB radiation, leading to the increased level of reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. 
Now, how will the patients with Kindler syndrome present? Well, this loss of gene basically affects patients at two sides, skin and mucosal surfaces. So, I'll be discussing these two areas while discussing the clinical features. The main clinical features of Kinder syndrome are skin blistering, photosensitivity, extensive skin atrophy, poikiloderma, which is the combination of skin atrophy, telangiectasias, and pigmentary changes, and seclerotic features. The phenotype is progressive during the patient's life. Like I said before, this loss in Kindlin 1 gene affects the two sides, skin and mucosa. So let's start with skin lesions. Skin blistering usually present at birth shows an acral distribution. It persists during the childhood but the tendency to develop blister decreases with age. Blisters have no characteristic features to allow the distinction from the other type of epidermolysis bullosa. Initially, they heal without scarring but skin atrophy and sclerosis develop over time. The severity of the photosensitivity is variable and seem to be independent of the skin phenotype. Most patients experience mild or unnoticeable photosensitivity. Skin atrophy on the dorsal aspects of hands and feet is recognizable as early as at the age of 1 to 2 years and is valuable clue for the diagnosis of Kindler syndrome. Poikiloderma can be first recognized around the age of 10 years, first localized to the sun-exposed area and later disseminated on the entire body surface. Many adults with Kindler syndrome have dry skin and develop diffuse keratosis of hands and feet. On this background, dermatophyte infections such as tinea pedis are common. Sclerotic features of the hands and feet such as webbing, sclerodermy form appearance of finger, or pseudoanum, which are the constrictions of the fingers, manifest in young adults with significant variability. Loss of dermatoglyphics mirrors skin atrophy and patients should be aware of these features. Moving on to hair and nail changes. Scalp hair is not changed, but adults with Kinder syndrome have sparse body hair. Nail dystrophy is common and may accompany the sclerosis of finger and pseudoanum. Onychomycosis can also be associated. Talking about mucosal lesions. Mucosal fragility is very common in patients with Kinder syndrome. The oral mucosa is most frequently affected with mechanically induced breathing and erosions and early and swear periodontis that may lead to the premature loss of teeth. Most young adults with Kindler syndrome suffer from progressive dysphagia and esophageal strictures requiring repeated dilations. Intestinal involvement has been reported in a few cases. Anal, urogenital and ocular mucosa involvement is also common Urethral stenosis can occur in male during childhood or later in life. Vaginal stenosis and effacement of the external female genitalia have been reported. Patients with ocular involvement may develop ectropion and recurrent keratoconjunctivitis resulting in simblephron. Mucocutaneous malignancies in Kindler syndrome. Patients with Kindler syndrome have an increased risk of mucocutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. The most frequently involved sites were the extremities, lips, and oral mucosa. Moving on to the diagnosis of Kindler syndrome. Can we diagnose Kindler syndrome on clinical basis? Well, in neonates, the diagnosis of Kindler syndrome cannot be suspected clinically, since blistering cannot be distinguished from the other types of epidermolysis bullosa. In older children, the coexistence of the skin blistering, photosensitivity, and cigarette paper like atrophy on the dorsal aspect of hands raise the suspicion of Kinder syndrome. In adults, poikiloderma, in conjunction with a history of blistering and photosensitivity during childhood, suggests the diagnosis. Can transmission electron microscopy and immunofluorescent antigen mapping make the diagnosis of Kinder syndrome? Well, to be honest, both of them will suggest the diagnosis of Kindler syndrome, but the gold standard for diagnosis is mutation analysis. I'll make a detailed video about these tests because they need an explanation on their own. In this video, I'll only be mentioning suggestive findings on both of these tests for Kindler syndrome. In Kindler syndrome, on transmission electron microscopy, the level of skin cleavage is variable, intraepidermal and subepidermal and can be discriminated by transmission electron microscopy. 
This technique demonstrates splits within the basal keratinocytes in the lamina lucida and or above the lamina densa as well as reduplication of the lamina densa of the basement membrane. However, transmission electron microscopy is not widely accessible and interpretation requires special expertise. Now let's move to the immunofluorescence antigen mapping. Immunofluorescence staining with antibodies to the components of the dermoepidermal junction zone for example, bullous pemphigoid antigen 1, laminin-332, collagen-7 and keratin-14 may be employed alternatively as a first diagnostic step in patients with suspected Kinder syndrome. This procedure is widely used for the diagnostics of other types of epidermolysis bullosa. In Kinder syndrome, the microblisters at the dermoepidermal junctions are indicated by the discontinuous staining of the markers such as the type 7 collagen or laminin-332. An irregular broad staining pattern of laminin-332 and type 7 collagen is highly suggestive of the diagnosis. This leads to an important question. Can we use antibodies against the Kindler 1? This leads to an important question. Why can't antibodies against Kindler? This leads to an important question. Why can't antibodies against the Kindler 1 be used to diagnose Kindler syndrome by immunofluorescent antigen mapping? A negative staining with antibodies to Kindler 1 would specifically indicate the absence of this protein in the patient's skin. However, the available antibodies are not suitable for the diagnosis due to a high background staining with only a faint specific signaling. Moving on to mutational analysis, like I said before, mutational rep analysis represents the gold standard for the diagnosis of Kinder syndrome. More than 70 distinct FIRM1 mutations have been reported. I will also talk about details of mutational analysis in my video of how to diagnose EB syndrome. Let's talk about differential diagnosis of EB syndrome. In children and adults, the differential diagnosis of Kinder syndrome includes three types of disorders. Other types of epidermolysis bullosa, poikilodermatous disorders, and sclerotic disorders. Now let's discuss them one by one. Dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. In many patients with Kinder syndrome, the diagnosis of dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa is first considered based upon the presence of the blistering, scarring, esophageal stenosis, and abnormal staining of the collagen 7 in the skin. The presence of skin atrophy, photosensitivity, poikiloderma, and gingivitis in Kindler syndrome may help to distinguish these two disorders. Junctional epidermolysis bullosa A distinct subtype of the late onset junctional epidermolysis bullosa caused by the specific mutation in the gene for the collagen 17 may be present with the clinical features that resemble Kindler syndrome. In particular, mild blistering, progressive skin atrophy, and irregular deposition of the markers along the dermoepidermal junction zone support the diagnosis of Kindler syndrome. Features that support the diagnosis of junctional epidermolysis bullosa include nail loss, lack of the photosensitivity, and the demonstration of the amino acid substitution in collagen 17. Epidermolysis bullosa simplex Patients with Kinder syndrome are sometimes initially diagnosed with epidermolysis bullosa simplex which shares some clinical features um, with Kindler syndrome such as mild acral blistering that improves with age. The identification of additional clinical and molecular characteristics of the Kindler syndromes allows the correct diagnosis. Dyskeratosis congenita is an inherited bone marrow failure syndrome associated with poikiloderma, palmar plantar hyperkeratosis, mucosal inflammation and predisposition to cancer. Detailed history, careful clinical assessment and laboratory workup allow the discrimination of these two entities. rothman thompson syndrome. This is characterized by poikiloderma, sparse hair, eyelashes and eyebrows, small stature, skeletal and dental abnormalities, cataracts and increased risk of cancer, especially osteosarcoma. Again, detailed history and careful clinical assessment allow the discrimination of the two entities. Systemic sclerosis Mild phenotypes in adults with Kindler syndrome may be misdiagnosed as systemic sclerosis. Based upon the presence of mucocutaneous findings, 
such as sclerotic fingers, microstomia, and esophageal stenosis. Moving on to management, there is no specific treatment for Kindler syndrome. There are no experimental targeted therapies such as gene cell or protein therapy envisioned so far to replace Kindler 1. The management is largely supportive and involves an interdisciplinary team for the treatment of the complications that occur progressively such as limited mobility of the fingers, esophageal and urethral stenosis, conjunctivitis, and swear periodontis. The management strategy involves general skin care measures, including avoidance of mechanical trauma and frequent use of moisturizers for blisters and erosions, antiseptics, and non-adhesive wound dressings should be employed. Patients should be educated to adopt photoprotection measures even if they do not manifest photosensitivity. Careful and regular dental care is mandatory to prevent the development of periodontitis. Mechanical pressure irritants of the oral mucosa should be avoided since they may contribute to the inflammation and carcinogenesis. Eye care, regular ophthalmic evaluation is an important part of the management of the patients with Kindler syndrome particularly for the patients who develop ectropion. Esophageal and urethral stenosis may require repeated dilators. Caloric supplementation and fluid diet should be considered if body mass index is reduced due to the difficulties in eating and swallowing. Hand surgery may be required for pseudoanum and pseudosyndactyly. Revertent skin patches can be used for the grafting. Patients should undergo regular total body examination for early detection of cancer starting at the age of 20 years. Prognosis and follow-up of Kinder syndrome Patients with Kinder syndrome can have a normal life expectancy but it can be reduced in the cases of malignancies. Complications such as limited mobility of fingers, esophageal and urethral stenosis, conjunctivitis and swear periodontitis are frequently and are frequent and require ongoing care. The prognosis is usually poor for the patients who develop mucocutaneous cancers. Close clinical surveillance for the early detention of mucocutaneous malignancies is therefore of key importance for these patients. Patients with Kinder syndrome are usually examined once a year to adjust skin care and detect complication. A closer follow-up is indicated for the patient treated for a mucocutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. The frequency of examination may vary for the individual patients based upon the extent of the disease and the clinical assessment of the risk for the recurrence. Thank you so much for watching my video. I think the only thing that I didn't discuss in this video was reverted mosaicism. It's a very very interesting topic and you should give it a read. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Instagram at Dr. Namra Aziz. See you soon. Bye bye.